You hear the voice of Bob Holt there, uh, sports writer extraordinaire from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and our usual Thursday guest right about now. He's with us on the phone. Bob, how are you today? Hey, how you guys doing? Doing great, doing great. So I was watching the media Zoom last night on our hitthatline.com page where you can find every media Zoom from all Arkansas coaches, all the players as well. And he does a great job putting that up there. And I did a double take too, just like Dave Van Horn. You had an interesting way of asking that question about how, if Arkansas baseball, softball, and track have successful weekends. Where'd that come from? Oh, well, just all those teams are um, are competing in Baton Rouge this weekend. Um, you know, so just kind of interesting. I mean, it may, there may be other times that four Arkansas teams have been at the same SEC venue on the same weekend, but I, if it's happened, I couldn't remember it. Yeah. I think you might have you might have meant to say kick butt too, uh, but and I have oh, problems. Well, with... well, yeah, but Go the ahead. thing is, you know, in, in softball and baseball, head to head, the track meet has several teams there, so and I, I'm not sure they're keeping score. They probably aren't, so it's not necessarily well, Arkansas is going to beat LSU in track that particular day, Saturday. It's more their athletes, you know, the Razorback athletes will go down there and you know put together a really good performance. So, so that was kind of a distinct way of saying that. Well, and you noticed something, too, that Dave uh, expounded on. We've picked up on this in the last, really, I feel like in the ever since the fall sports season started. And, and, and you've been covering Arkansas athletics for, you know, since the early 80s. So you, you know a lot of the, the, the coaching staffs at the various sports over the years and, and how that dynamic might have played out on campus inside the athletic department. It seems to me like... Dave Van Horn has referred to it as we're all on the same team, you know. Uh, I mean, he and Coach Diefel seem to have a great relationship. I know Courtney Diefel says Sam Pittman texts her right after a series win. Um, it really feels like, and the, I don't know if this if this is the same on most college campuses. It can't be because they're so competitive and there are limited resources still, uh, even in the, amongst the largest athletic departments. It feels, Bob, like, I mean, not only are all these coaches rooting for each other, but they're following each other pretty closely, too. Yeah, I think on some campuses there's probably some jealousy. You know, if certain sports uh, are taken attention away from other sports, they, they, things like that. But, yeah, that, I, mean, um, I mean, success obviously breeds success. I think you know, Eric Musselman mentioned this um might have been when he was talking about when he signed his new contract, but you know, obviously Eric had a pro background before he got in the college coach a few years ago at Arizona State as an assistant, and then he, he worked his way up to be the head coach here. And you know, Eric talked about how you know how, how much he enjoys the college you know experience and the atmosphere, and you know, and going to various uh, sporting events. And you know, you see Eric tweeting about being at baseball games or women's basketball games. Seeing Mike Neighbor seemed to have a great relationship. I think a lot of times teams can help each other recruit, you know, like Mike yeah. neighbors might have a recruit on campus and, and, you know, Eric might talk to her and, and the same might happen with, and, and vice versa. And, and, you know, with, with softball and baseball track, obviously it was very closely aligned with men's and women's programs. And, um, so yeah, I think it's a really good, good uh, you know, it, 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 you know, the coaches talked about, how close the golf team came to winning last weekend in the SEC championships. And, um, you know, both uh, Chris Buckham and and, uh, and Dave, you know, mentioned that in separate Zooms, you know. Um, they, they weren't on together or anything. I know you've had a lot of coaches throughout the first pitch of baseball games. I remember uh, uh, Jordan Weber, the gymnastics coach, did that. She did like a, a backflip or side flip or some kind of gymnastics move. <laughs> Picked up the ball and threw it. I know Eric threw out the first pitch. Mike Anderson did it when he was a basketball coach. Chris Buffin did it after winning the national championship in indoor track. I'm sure other coaches have done it. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's a pretty cool thing. I'm sure that uh, Hunter Yurchek has probably helped foster that. But, um, but yeah, it's, I mean, the, the coaches talked about that, how they kind of all are, are pulling for each other. It's so funny because I've heard in other cases where I mean, I'll give you, for instance, and I don't remember the exact story around it, but essentially, like, Bobby Petrino didn't even know who John Pelfrey was. And yet they're on the same campus working for the same athletic department, and one guy, you know, I, you know, had a little more tunnel vision on what he was doing than than maybe most people do. But I think that also speaks to the, you know, the personality of the people we're talking about more than anything. 
But, Bob, I mean, people love to follow winners. You know, there's a lot of love and happiness around winning programs. So part of it, I think you're right about Hunter Juracek. I think he does foster that kind of atmosphere. Winning always helps. People always want to follow winners, especially if, you know, you all wear the same Razorback logo. That's got to be one reason why. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Petrino, because um, when I was talking to, uh, to Cordy Dyson, she was relating that story about, you know, after they beat Missouri on Monday night, but kind of a rough weekend. You know, they lost back-to-back games for the first half all year. And um, she, she said, like, to the first text she got, that, you know, because she's not checking her cell phone during the game. And um, right after the game, she checked her calls, and two of the first texts she got were from Sam Pittman and and uh, Dave Van Horn. She was saying, I just want to be, I haven't done a lot of campuses where the football coach and the baseball coach are texting the softball coach. And, that, and we, as she was saying that, I was thinking, yeah, I can't imagine Bye Petrino doing that. I guess this kind of popped in my head. Um, I'll, I'll always get Petrino to do as X and O's coach and the guy who puts together game plans and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, you just you can't imagine Bye Petrino doing that, frankly. Bob Hall joining um, Bob Hall joining us here on halftime. Bob, let's transition over to the NFL draft coming up tonight, round one this evening, and then rounds two and three Friday, and then four through seven Saturday. I wanted to focus on the Razorbacks for me because we won't have you on for the rest of the week. What's your feeling about some of these Razorbacks that could go? We can start with Felipe Franks. Where do you see Felipe possibly falling in this NFL draft? Yeah, I probably think all those the Razorbacks. I'd, I'd be pretty surprised if they had anybody drafted before. Uh, the third day, which is the four through seven rounds, I believe. Um, but yeah, I think definitely, yeah, I think the Felipe Franks, I mean, he showed a big arm, you know. Well, he, everybody knew he had a big arm before he came to Arkansas, but yeah, I think that was definitely a good move for him to come. It was a good move for Arkansas for sure. But I think uh, it was mutually beneficial because he got to, you know, another year to start and to shine in that offense and throw a lot of deep balls and show good leadership. Um, I think, you know, teams. Uh, they, they draft off talent, but you know there's an interesting video that, that Nick Saban had that's been circulating on Twitter about you know the, being the and or the but, and, and the and is like all the other intangibles you add to, to a team besides your talent, and the but is but issues you might have you know off you know that, that don't you know help a team, and I think Felipe Franks is definitely an and guy. You know he played through some injuries and. He became a leader very quickly, and so I think he's got a lot of good intangibles teams are looking for. He's also got a big arm. He's older, you know, mm. and so I think, he, you know, he's not going to be drafted, obviously, in the first round, but I think he's definitely a guy that will be drafted and that could add something to a team. I can see where teams could say, you know, he's not going to be drafted to be their, their starter right away, but he's a guy that, that could be a good backup and might be able to develop into a starter. But he's definitely got an NFL arm, that's for sure. Absolutely. I think the one, the common denominator, I think that me and Phil both agree on and probably the most listeners, I feel like the first Razorback that will be drafted will be Jonathan Marshall. And you look at some of these mock drafts, and he seems to be towards the tail end of some, but then on the front end of some. So kind of varies from time to time. Do you think Jonathan Marshall will be the first Razorback taken and possibly in the fourth round on Saturday? That wouldn't surprise me. Um, he had a great senior year. You know, he's a guy that always had the uh, the physical uh, abilities. And you hear a lot about uh, people talk about, you know, his size and then the quickness he had, just a combination of athleticism and, um, you know, in, in, in a big man's body. And then he really shined in this defense last year. And I know he, he did really well in his testing on pro days. And so, yeah, I could definitely see – him being the first guy picked and, um, you know, be yeah, fourth round, maybe just make up in the third round, you know, that, that thing all it takes is one team to really like you. But, and I think he's another one of those quote and guys that has a lot of, a lot of value, uh, with other things, you know, intangible, just his attitude and leadership. He's, you know, he's a quiet guy, I think from the standpoint of, I mean, he's always a great guy to interview, very cooperative, but he's kind of a quiet leader, but guy leads by example. We were earlier in the show, Bob, we were talking about our personal NFL teams because Phil's obviously with the Steelers. I'm a big Cowboys fan, and you're our Green Bay Packer fan. And before I ask you this question, I wanted to, I wanted to read you this tweet that came from Bill Michaels, and apparently the 49ers were trying to do some business with the Packers and try to trade their third overall pick to the Packers, and that included sending Aaron Rodgers to the 49ers, and that would bring Jimmy Garoppolo to Green Bay, which I, that thing would just turn over upside down. I feel like, I feel like you'd agree if y'all traded Aaron Rodgers to the 49ers, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. That, that's maybe some 49er fans fantasy <laughs> or something. I don't know who would be putting that out. But yeah. Aaron Rodgers has still got a. He's got a lot of good games left in him, and and my only hope is that the Packers don't draft another quarterback in the first round. I think we've had enough of that. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully they'll hopefully they'll get one of those good receivers that'll still be available. Uh, you know, late in the first round. Um, or somebody on offense, you know, but yeah, oh, hopefully a receiver. Yeah, that was going. That was going to be my follow-up question. That we, we we're going to put put your GM hat on. If you're the GM of the Green Bay Packers, are you going receiver? Do you think you might go defense, go playmaker? What? So it sounds like to me you're thinking the Green Bay needs to go receiver in the first round. Well, yeah, as long as there's somebody available who has that pick matches up with in terms of the value of the pick. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in best available. I think that's how you build a championship team. That's why the Packers have won so consistently for so long is that they, they pick the right guys at the right time most of the time. You know, they weren't they weren't looking to pick Aaron Rodgers that year they picked him, but he just they had him rated as like the second or third guy on their board and there he is sitting there at twenty four. But they still had had Brett Favre and of course Favre didn't like that pick very much, but it ended up being a great yeah. thing for everybody because you know, Aaron Rodgers got to develop for, behind Brett Favre for a couple of years, and he was definitely ready to take over as a starter. And, um, you know, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, I would like to take a receiver as long as there's a quality receiver available at that spot, you know. Well, right now, Phil and uh, Bob, right now it's, uh, ESPN's predicting Rashad Bateman, a uh, receiver out of Minnesota. That's the mock draft for the first round. All right. Sounds like you might, <clears throat> according to ESPN, you're going to get what you would like, Bob. Not all of us get that in life. Appreciate. Well, we'll, we'll have to see about that. We'll, you know. we'll we'll see if ESPN is right or if or if they're wrong, and we'll find out in, in a few hours. Appreciate you, Bob. We'll do it again next week. Thanks so much. Okay, you guys take care. You got it. I think that interview. I think that conversation kicked ah or kicked butt. I don't, know, Bob, yeah. I don't know if he wanted to go in that direction again. That, that felt like a moment where he just wasn't sure what he had said on the on the Zoom. I just love the reaction from Dave Van Horn. Hey, it happens. What? what? It happens to the best of us. Hey, uh, if you are going to be doing some cold water bass fishing these days, you're going to need to use the Umbrella Flash Mob Jr. because it's the best lure for duplicating a small school of shad. It can be worked from the top of the water column to the bottom. Whether you're trying to win a bass tournament or just whoop up in a bunch of white bass and stripers, the Umbrella Flash Mob Jr. will catch him. You'll find it at Walmart, Bass Pro Shops, Academy, Lornet.com, and tackle stores all over the place. The Umbrella Flash Mob Jr. First hour wraps.